I'm going to start off by saying what the shell is. Back in the early days, before Unix, a shell was something which sat round the kernel and protected it from everything else. And there were lots of things you could only do with the shell. It was privileged. So if you wanted to join this file descriptor inside your program to the, the file name that over there, you'd have to do it in some kind of job control language or shell. Right? And if you've used BMS or OS360, then you'll still be doing that kind of thing. So some people think of it like a, you know, a, the shell around a walnut kernel. And that's where we get the kernel versus shell kind of idea. Another way to think about it is like what you live inside when you're in the terminal. And you reach out through the shell to do stuff. And um, some people think it's a way to protect yourself from all the uh, Unix nasties that might be up there. But basically, you've got the kernel down the bottom there, in the middle. And I work on that quite a bit, and so does a cast of thousands. And then the shell is normally the first program that's invoked by the kernel when you log in to do things. And it will then run through a whole heap of scripts. If you're running a window manager, it will start your window manager. If you're on the console, it will give you a login prompt. Oh, sorry, it will give you a prompt that you can type at. So it looks like that. But as far as we're concerned from a programming perspective, the shell is glue. You don't do much in the shell itself, but you use it to glue together other programs. There are many things called the shell. There's the C shell, the TC shell, which is the C shell with extra interactive bits added. There's the Born shell, which is the original one. There's the Corn shell, which was took the Born shell and added some stuff like uh, functions and uh, a few extra interactive features. There's the Born Again shell, which is Bash, which is probably on your machine now. Then there's Z shell, there's oodles of them. The one I'm going to be covering is mostly some kind of inter command interpreter. We're going to be mostly covering the subset of the 1003.2 born shell. So POSIX 1003.2 standardized what a shell should look like. And almost all of the shells you have, except for C shell and CTC shell, implement some approximation to that POSIX subset. OK, so that's where we're going to go. Right, first shell program. I'm hoping you've got your laptops and you can use Vi or Nano or something. Yeah? What? Yeah, don't worry, use the back ticks. I'll come to you a little bit later. Yes, I know they are. Oh, hang on. I've got to go back here. This stupid thing. Yeah. Oh, now it's going too far. Yeah, here we go. Oh, one, one more. And then try it out. I'll give you a few moments to type it in. I'm hoping you're all fast typers. There's lots of typing to do. You might find that you don't have banner. That one there. Oh, hang on, what's going on here? There. If you don't have banner, use echo instead. It won't look as good. All magic so far. <coughs> this uh, script illustrates a number of things. First one is hash introduces a comment. 
Anything after a hash character to the end of the line is ignored by the shell. The Linux kernel, if it sees hash bang at the beginning of the first line of a file, treats that as a magic number that means that the thing that comes after it is the interpreter for this file. So if you want to write a shell script, you put hash bang slash bin slash sure as the first line. Right? If you want to use Perl, you'd push hash bang slash user bin Perl or whatever. X is a shell variable, it gives a sign 9. T put, which we're using three times, is a program that comes with the incursive suite. It's for writing characters to the terminal for controlling your, your terminal. In this case, first we clear it, then we do a cursor positioning to five lines down, zero columns. T put ED, which means erase at the end of the display. Then we call banner, which writes its stuff up in big letters. Then we add one to subtract one from X and sleep for one second. The interesting thing there is that all of those ones in red are actually external programs. They're not part of the shell. The only bit of the shell we're using here is the shell variable, the back tick to get the output of a process into a shell variable, and the while loop. The rest is not shell. So strictly speaking, I shouldn't be teaching it to you, should I? No? OK, I'll show you what it looks like on my machine. spell. I can't read this either. So there you go. You don't look that nice with echo. No, it doesn't look anywhere near that nice with echo. Hmm? Different version of banner. That would be the BSD version of Banner, not the System 5 version of Banner. Okay, if you haven't already done it, please grab that tarball and unpack it. This will save you typing. Um, if you've got your web connection and you go to the wiki page with the shell tutorial, that URL is already in there, so you can just click on it. But I don't know what's quicker, whether you can type it in or get it. What are you doing here? You already know shell programming. Badly. Oh, okay. Okay, people managed to grab that yet? Can I go to the next slide? Uh, only trap for the unwary is that's LCA 11. It's almost hard to see that's LCA 11, not L call. So, yeah. A red pen? Yeah, the green's a bit hard to see. Okay, sure. So we can keep moving. Because shells mostly glue to glue other things together, you need to be able to find out about those other things. The shell, ma the manual is your friend. If you type "men test," you can see what all the other things you can test for. Yep, in Bash. Test is built in in Bash, but it's also available as a separate program. 
There are some subtle differences. If you're using a busy box shell, it's not built in. So, man dash k, then a keyword, will look up that keyword in the manual's index and try and tell you which ones are available. That's really useful. Um, that's got an alias apropos, but I can never remember how many P's and O's it's got in it, so man dash k. And man sh itself, to see what the shell can do is glue. That's really useful bedtime reading. Okay. The thing that most beginners get wrong is how the shell actually reads things into its input. It reads it one line at a time, very slowly. The first thing it does is tokenize the line that's there. It then looks, at, looks for variables and parameters and expands those. And just as you know, string substitution. It then looks for wild cards and expands those. It then does command substitution, either with the back ticks or there's another syntax which we'll show you later. It, then it splits it into words using the shell variable IFS, which we'll come to later as well. It then splits it into jobs, where jobs are separated by um, semicolons or um, double pipes or double ands or ands or whatever. We'll come to those in a little bit too. And finally, it executes the commands. So let's show how this works. Let's say you type ls dollar home slash a dash b dash c dot. So C dot Z, right? So the first thing it does is tokenize it. So it divides it into those three tokens. It's then it's going to do brace expansion. Um, a comma B dot C could also be A dot dot C. I should warn you that the brace expansion was in an early draft of the POSIX standard, then they took it out again. So bash does it, dash doesn't. So don't rely on it. That then expands to this, and then we look for variables. Expand them. Then we're going to do globbing. A star should match all files beginning with A, right? In this case, we've got a few in there. But there's no files beginning with B, so B star is not expanded, just left as it is. And finally, it has to search dollar path for ls and find it in slash bin and paths all of the arguments to ls. This is different from some other systems where the command itself does the expansion of globbing and so forth. The shell does that before the um, command actually sees it. Okay? Yeah, I gave you that warning. So, a second shell program. Um, if you look in there, there should already one, be one called echo line or something like that. Have a look at it. It might be different from this one. But do try the exercises here um, and see what happens. See if you can see what the result's going to be before you do it. For x, the for loop sets x to each of the things that come after it in turn. In this case, there isn't anything after it, so it will set it to all of the arguments to this shell script in turn. Does it do what you expect? Good. What this is showing you is different forms of quoting. So what this will do is go through the arguments one at a time and put one per line on your output. In this case, the first argument is A, the second is B, the third one is B, C, D with a space in it, which we will get there. The third, fourth argument is E, F with a space in it. And the fifth argument is GH with a space in it. We've got three different forms of quoting there. Double quotes, single quotes, and backslash. When you've tried it out, remove the double quotes there, and then try that line again and see what happens.
And in particular, try it with a few more spaces in there instead of just one. Can anybody predict for me what it's going to do? <coughs> no? What you should see is that the argument boundaries are still preserved. So you still get a line with A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, H. But multiple spaces are collapsed to a single space because echo echoes each of its arguments with a single space between them. And when you take the, um, the quotes away, dollar $x expands to two arguments to echo. So any white space between them gets lost and gets converted to a single space in the output. Next step, file descriptors. Yep. Curious about the backslash of the D there. Yep. Well, it, it's difficult to ignore the... It quotes the space. Oh, it quotes it? Yeah. Oh, okay. It means it's not part of a... It, we're not starting a new argument. Uh, yeah. In POSIX and UNIX and Linux, there are three standard file descriptors that everybody needs to know. There's the standard input, that most programs will read from, there's the standard output that most programs will write to, and there's the standard error for putting error output onto. Um, these are inherited from the parent. So if, you, if a particular process like the shell has a particular standard input, standard output, and standard error, then all the programs run from that shell will, will share that unless you do something special. When you log in, they set your controlling terminal. If you've got an X terminal there, or a GNOME terminal or whatever, they'll be set to the pseudo TTY that's attached to that. So basically, when you type, the stuff will go into the standard input, file descriptor zero, of the process that you're, that's currently running. So it's important to remember those, zero, one, and two. The standard form of a command is environment variable settings, like foo equals bar, the command itself, and then redirections. So here's a couple of redirections. This one uses three and two. So three gets created for this case. And then inside the command, if write to file descriptor three, we'll end up on that, that stream. Don't worry about the exact syntax. We'll go into it in more detail. But that's the general form. What that does in the shell is it opens foo with o create and o trunk. So it'll dis destroy it and open it. Make that file descriptor into file descriptor 3 and then close it, just like you would. And then the second line says make file descriptor 2 the same as file descriptor 3. So that's what that one does. So if you're, if you're a C programmer, that set of redirections essentially does this stuff. The general form, and I'm only showing this for output, for, for input just put the um, arrow the other way. N onto file, creates the file, and attaches file descriptor n onto it, where n is a, is a small number. If you leave n off, then file descriptor 1 is assumed. Onto and duplicates it. And there you've got to specify both numbers. Oh no, sorry, no. Again, if you leave off capital N, it'll be assumed to be 1. And onto and dash closes the file descriptor. And that's sometimes useful to prevent file descriptors leaking into um, some environment which you want to be semi-secure of. You can also do onto onto for open, instead of truncating to zero length, open it for append. And that way, all the stuff that gets written to that file descriptor gets written to the end of the file. So if you've got multiple files, multiple processes all writing to the same file, they'll be interleaved at the end of the file and things will work nicely for a log file or something like that. One very common idiom, if you've got a pipe, and we haven't really come to pipes yet, then standard input of this command is normally attached to standard output of that command. If you want to send the, the error output through 2, then you need to use 2 onto M1 to duplicate 2 onto 1 before the pipe. All right? Okay, some quick and dirties. If you're a good typist, 
and you don't want to, use, to, to spy up the events, and you want to create a file, just do cat onto slash tim slash foo and then start typing and then end with the control D at the beginning of the line. Now, in Unix and Linux, reading zero characters indicates an end of file. So if you put a control D, which is end of transmission character, it says deliver whatever you've got in your buffer to the, to the, to the file on the next read. So effectively, that says this is the end of file. So control D, end of file, that's all you really need to remember. So, what does that do? You know, with no command. Put some random text into a file called Nope. That bit there does, but what does that bit there? On its own. With nothing else on the line. Nope. Yeah. So it creates the file, truncates it to zero length, and then there's no command, so it doesn't do anything else. So the file's closed and you carry on. So that's a quick way of truncating a file to zero length and creating it if it isn't there. But, uh, huh? So you don't need to use touch file, just onto file and it'll create it. And also make sure it's a zero length. What's wrong with using touch? It's an external process and it's more, it's more expensive to use. Um, the point with touch is it will not tr truncate it too. will create the dump because it always opens it with o create o trunk. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about that because the... Uh, yeah, it'll vary between systems. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, what about this one? Exec. We haven't introduced exec yet. What exec does is it replaces the current shell with whatever the normal argument in there is. Uh, can't, can't see the thing there. Right? So in this case, I'll just tell you, um, what that will do is say the current standard output of this shell goes into slash tim slash foo. One common thing that you need for debugging is set dash x exec to onto onto slash tim slash log or something like that while you're debugging a shell script. Set dash x says echo all the commands as they've ex executed. This then says set, send the standard output of the shell onto that file. So while you're running your file, you don't see anything in your current window, which is good if this is something, you know, the PVP daemon or something like that. But you get a log of everything that the shell did. And that can get you out of a hole if your shell script is, say, um, the thing that sets up DNS when you establish a PVP tunnel or something like that. Bring that down again. Jobs. We have to go through this fairly fast so we can get to the interesting stuff. Um, jobs are separated by new lines. So if you just type something and hit new line, that will be executed and run. Or a semicolon, so you can put two on the same line with a semicolon between them. Or an ampersand. An ampersand says, don't wait for this one to finish, just let it go. So putting an ampersand on the end of your line runs it in the background. That's really nice. So long running process and another process and starts that process and that process in parallel. Each process has an exit value. In that very first shell script that you wrote, the bang, you had a while test dash something. Test, test returns a zero exit status while its condition is true and a non-zero exit status when that condition is false. In general, Zero means success, and a non-zero means fail. If you kill a process with a, a signal, then the um, signal number is encoded into that exit status, um, plus the top bit set. Unfortunately, signal numbers are totally non-portable, so you can't really rely on which signal is which. The special variable dollar question mark contains the last exit value. And we'll do an exercise on this in a minute. No, because the next time you run something, it comes along again. For an asynchronous command, if you can know the process ID of that asynchronous command, you can wait for it and get its exit value. And we'll come to that as an example in a minute. And you can use and, 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 or, or to join commands. 
and these are shortcutting. They're strictly left to right shortcutting operations. The exit status of a job which is joined together with or, or, and, and, and is the one of the last one actually run. So, let's give some example. Please type these in and see what happens. The bottom one's a tricky one, it's a single bar because we're piping the output of false into true. Yes. Yep. It's the it's the right most. No. Um, it's the right most one that actually gets executed. No, they're not in parallel. This one will be started, and then this one will be started, and this one's the one that will be waited for. So. Mm. Yeah. No, they don't take long. Okay, have people done that? What have you seen? No. What? When you do an echo, when you, when you do echo dollar question mark? Yeah. You should get the return code. So you should see zero there. And there you should see one. Because true and and false, the true succeeds, which means the thing on the right hand side is executed, and false returns a non-zero exit status. So there you go. And that one should give you zero because true is the last thing to be executed. All right. How does that affect the Yeah. If you send a signal to an execute to a to a process and the process dies as a result of that signal, yeah. then the exit status will be included in the exit code. So it'll be 128 plus the signal value. Oh, okay. So you send SIG 15, it'll be 128 plus 15, which is 143. Okay? Yeah. The only problem is that signal numbers are not portable except for a few of them like nine. And that says we've been killed by a signal. All right. <laughs> yeah. But the low numbers, you can um, set yourself you, you, with exit, whatever. <coughs> oh, yeah. It's all, it's all rearranged and munged, so don't worry about it. So here's an example um, that uses some of those things. This one calls GREP, which is another really useful tool for your toolbox. That says, globally search for a regular expression and print it. In this case, the regular expression is just a simple string, P to C. Look for it in the central password, which is the uh, database containing the names of all the users. Throw away the output. Onto slash dev slash null says, throw away the output. Two onto and one, throw away any errors. And then the or or on the end. The shell's then smart enough to know that it hasn't finished the, the thing, so you can continue on the next line without anything else. Echo onto and two, so we're going to put this on the out, on the standard error, not the standard output. I'm not in the password file. Hey! So does that make sense? If the string is found in there, then this will exit zero, and this bit here will not be executed. If this string is not found in there, grep will exit non-zero, and this bit will be executed, and we'll see that, com that message come out on standard error. And the exit status is always zero, which is exactly what you want for this particular case. Okay, um, we mentioned path. It's worth talking a little bit more about path. Um, path is a list of colon separated directories. And when the shell, or actually when the kernel searches for a um, program, yeah, you're right, exec ve. When, when the C library searches for it, <laughs> it's, it's in, it is, it is in, it's in exec VP. Yeah, anyway. Um, it splits these on the colons and searches first in bin and second in slash user bin. If you, look, if you do echo dollar path, you'll see a lot more things in it than that. There are a few other path-like variables. One of them is CD path. This one's useful. When you type CD to change directory, the name you give that will be searched for in CD path. Now you'll notice that dot's in CD path, but dot is not in path. That's deliberate. 
If you CD to something, you expect to be able to, from a current directory, get to subdirectories of that current directory. So you want the current directory in CD path. But you do not normally want to be able to ex execute things that are in your current directory because as super user, someone says, uh, will you come over and have a look at this? Um, you just need to fix this up a bit. And they, they've um, renamed ls to be some kind of set UID thingy in your current directory, and they, they persuade you to go there. You type ls to find out what's there, and it does something else and gives them super user pri 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 privilege. So you don't want dot in your path. Another one, interesting one, is mail path. This one's more for interactive shells than for shell scripting, but it's interesting. So I'll, I'll leave it to you. This is a list of files, not directories. And the shell will check these every time it prints a prompt to see whether they've changed since the last time it checked. And if it has, it'll print out a little message saying, you have mail. However, it's not just for mail files. You can use it for anything. One neat little trick is if you've got some long job running job and you want to wait for it to, and you want to be told when it's finished, just set up your long job. Long job. And then semicolon. And then echo or, or onto um, finished. And then have finished in your mail path. Then when that long running job actually finishes, finished will be created with a zero length and um, your shell will tell you it's finished. That's more useful if you're working on the console than if you're working on multiple um, uh, windows in a X environment, but still, it's still sometimes useful. Okay, another one. You'll probably find one there already called my witch, which is essentially this one. We're illustrating one more feature this time. We've already talked about path, but this time we're going to get the shell to split it up. Now the shell first reads this and tokenizes it. And when it gets to the point where it's going to split it into words, path's already been expanded to be a colon list, separated list of things. right? And setting the IFS, the internal field separator to colon, says split that up on the colon and make each of those a separate argument to four. So the effect is that dear will be set in turn to each of the elements of path. And then we can test to see whether that thing is executable, and if it is, echo it. I use this one a lot because the standard witch doesn't tell you if there's two things in your path that are shadowing each other. This one will. Corn shell and bash. Okay, that must be newer. It didn't used to be there. Yep. If I did nothing with my bash RC or pod or yep. where 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 is this slash bin slash uh, user bin part set initially? Okay, um, it's inherited from your parent. So init, the the grandparent of all the processes, sets a default one. Um, on Debian systems, I can't mark talk for other ones, there's a file called etc profile which modifies it a bit. So when, when your shell starts up it does a lot of stuff. Um, depending on which shell it does different things. So um, there's a file called dot profile in your home directory and it'll source that and you can put stuff in there. Um, for bash there's also one called bash rc which is read on every single invocation of bash. Um, for some shells, there's a dot login. Bash decides to obey both dot profile and dot login, except if you put it in POSIX mode when it only reads dot profile. Yeah, that's another one too. There's also a dot bash login. And a dot bash profile. Usually C shell, not always. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, that's, that's all added up. But there's also um, etc. profile, where stuff's done for everybody on the system. But that's an aside. <laughs> okay, have people had a go at this? Let's see what happens. It's fun, isn't it? Um, 
when you invoke the shell, you can give arguments. Um, but you can also change those arguments inside the shell with the set directive. So th this is the format of it, set dash option, dash dash to separate option arguments from real arguments, and then all the args. So if you want, after you've uh, started running the shell to find out what's going on, you would say set dash x or set dash v. Those are two rather useful ones. Set dash v displays the commands as they're being read before they've been tokenized and all the rest of it. Set dash x displays each command before it's executed in its fully expanded form. So after it's been tokenized and after parameters have been expanded and variables have been expanded and things. Those are really, really useful. And what I suggest you do is go back to this one and in this time say shirt dash x wh and then give it some uh, thing, ls or something and see what it's actually doing. Dash V just says it as it reads. It doesn't do it as it, is, it, it is exec, execs the things. What was that? Hmm? Yeah. Dash, dash V and Dash X both show you what's in the script, but Dash V will show you the script as it's so it's a loop, it can just show you the loop. Oh, okay. And dash X will show you as it goes around the loop, it'll turn based on that. Yeah. So try them out. Are we having fun yet? Except that it doesn't see instead of in yeah, shell. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty easy. Yeah. Okay. Cool, eh? Okay. Um, we'll get to the arg one, arg two, and so forth later. But um, here's an example for you. Uh, once again, get ent is a, a utility for getting stuff out of the password database. It'll look up, uh, et cetera, nsswitch.conf and pull things out of LDAP or NIS or et cetera, password, whichever one your system's been set up. So that sets X to the password entry for the first argument of this shell script. We then set IFS to dash again, to colon again, and do a set dash dash dollar X. And at that point, all of those fields in your password entry, you know, the, the login ID, the UID, the group ID, and so forth, which were separated by colons in the original, and now set for arguments to the shell. And you can pick them out with $1, $2, $3, $4, $5, and so on. We'll be doing more than arguments in a minute. So that's just a little example. Variable expansion. Um, variables can be anything providing it starts with a uh, a letter or underscore. After that you can have letters, numbers or underscores. You can delimit the variable name with braces. So if you've got, uh, oh I don't know, if you're trying to build a temporary file and you've got some prefix, you could say dollar uh, temp prefix foo. And that will take the expansion of that and append foo onto the end of it. If you had without the braces, then it would be a variable called temp prefix foo, which is not what you want. There's a few special forms. Dollar hash is the number of arguments to the shell script. Or if, when we get to shell functions, the number of arguments to the shell function. Dollar bang is the PID, the process ID of the last asynchronously executed job. You should always capture that, if, you, if you're going to need it, straight after the ampersand. Well, on the next line or whatever. Because next time you do another asynchronous job, it'll be overwritten by the next one. So, let's go. zero is the name of the script that you're currently running. It may or may not have the, direct, the full directory path name of it beforehand. In general, assume it has in your, in your use of it. But it may not depending on exactly how things match it. And we mentioned dollar question mark already. There's a whole heap more special forms, but these are the only ones I'm going to be dealing with in this tutorial. See the man page or the posits.2 spec for the rest of them. So, shell variable expansion. 
If you set foo to home fed and echo dollar foo, you'll see home fed. You can then use dollar foo instead of home fed to, and change directory to it. And there we are. We can set b equal to the name of a program and just type dollar b and we'll get the program run. All make sense so far? Can't see too many blank locks. We talked a little bit about setting the environment. If you just type foo equals bar, and then type set through get foo, you'll see foo equals bar. Oh, I didn't mention set on its own prints out all the current variables that are set. And in some shells, it'll also print out all the shell functions there are. And you get lots and lots of them. That's why pipe it through get foo. All right, so that, that works nicely, right? This only works because set is a shell built-in. Foo equals bar sets the value of foo for this shell script only, for this shell only. Env is a separate program that shows you what the environment is. That's which shell variables are available to subprocesses. And in this case, we don't see anything. If we type export foo, that says put this shell variable into the environment for subshells to use. Then we can see it. Right? Some special parameter forms, and we'll be using these again later too. You'll notice this one's a brace surrounded. Parameter is the name of the variable, and then you've got a colon and a dash. That says if parameter is set or non-null, use it. If it's either not set or null, that is, it's set to nothing, use the value of word instead. This one here does the same, but it also initializes parameter to the value of that word. This is really useful for setting defaults for things. If you omit the colon, it means only test for set and allow nulls. So here's an example. I've got a script for building the, the, the Linux kernel. And as one of the first things in that script, I've got this statement. The colon is a shell built in that does absolutely nothing. But before it does absolutely nothing, its arguments need to be expanded and tokenized and split into words and so forth. So the effect of this is if CC is not set, or it's set to nothing, set it to the string gcc-40. But if you've set cc on the command line before you enter this script, it'll use the value you've set. Is it set only for uh, using or is it set to also in other No, it's only, it's only set okay. into, into this shell. The question is, is that also exported and put in the environment? The answer is no, not unless it was already in the environment. Just for everyone's awareness, we are recording this. It's going to be available on the internet afterwards, so uh, if you can either ask for the microphone uh, so that we get your question, or if, Peter, if you could repeat the question, yeah, that'd be okay. fantastic. Thanks. All righty, so there you go. Quoting. We've already seen quoting, but I wanted to go through the details so we've got all the details. There's three forms. A backslash quotes the next character, so you can turn off the special meaning of any character of the shell with a backslash beforehand. This used to be really tricky because backslash also used to be the teletype quote character, so we ended up having to type two, two copies of a backslash in order to get it into through the teletype driver, and then another one to sort of quote it. So if you actually wanted to put a, a literal quote in the shell script, you had to type it four times. Nowadays it's simpler, because we're not using backslash anymore as a quote, TTY quote character, we're using control V, I think it is. So it's much simpler. Single quotes prevent everything from being expanded. So anything between single quotes is totally literal, including double quote characters. A double quote allows parameter expansion and backtick command expansion. But after it's finished, everything between the double quotes is still a single word for the purpose of the next stage in the, um, the, the, the shell's uh, eating of the, the command line. So, some examples. If we set h equals to foo bar, then echo dollar h, what do you expect to see? Exactly, try it out. Because that's what I expect too. <laughs> yeah, um, it was tricky to get the type setting right. What about ex echo backslash dollar? You'll just see dollar H, yeah. Because the backslash removes the special meaning from dollar and then disappears. So you end up with just dollar H. 
How about just echo dollar of H? Yep, that's right. And then you can try the other ones yourself. Double quote protects everything inside it from being touched by the shell. So it'll just be used verbatim. So that should give you the idea of how to, to combine variables and use them. We're going to need this stuff. Grouping. Um, there's two different ways of grouping things within the shell. The first one is with, break, with parentheses. Parentheses start a subshell. So this is effectively the, the, the shell forks and um, the things that happen inside the, break, the, the parentheses happen in a separate shell. So nothing that you do in there is visible to the outside world. You can redirect the whole output at once. So here's an example. We cd slash echo star ls and we pipe the output through less. The interesting thing here is that cd there is effective only to the shell that's running those commands. It's not effective affecting your, the, the current shell. So it protects it. Braces start a simple group. Again, you can redirect the whole lot as a, as a group. Variable changes within there will be visible, and current working directories changes, that is CD, will also be visible. So here's an example. Um, we'll echo that, and then cat etc. password and pipe the result through less. Sorry, it split off the end of the line. Basically what we're doing here is we're adding a, um, a header to the contents of slash password, etc. password. Would you, would you mind go back in? That one? Yeah. So if I wanted the... Of the list. Yep. Uh, if I do a semicolon and then uh, echo uh, for a pip, I would get the pip of the. No. The question is, how would you get the process ID of less? Yeah. Um, the process ID you can only get for asynchronous processes. You can't get it for synchronous processes. And less is running as a synchronous process is going to be waited for by the shell. So you can only do that if you end the line with an ampersand which doesn't make sense for less because you actually want to see its output. If it was something else there and you put an ampersand on the end, then you could um, grab it with uh, dollar bang. Yeah. Okay. OK? Go back to here. So that's that one. So here documents. Um, we're running through this really fast. I'm expecting your brain to be exploding by the end of this. Um, this is a way of getting stuff as standard input that's in line in your shell script. So. The double herringbone here marks the beginning of a, of a here document. The things that come after it are an optional dash and then some token. It doesn't matter what that token is. It could be a single exclamation mark, it could be an underscore, it could be some number. Anything that's not going to appear in the body of the text because it's used as the marker for the end of the here document. A lot of people use EOF for end of file. Is that minus sign up there meant to be there? Yes, it is. The minus sign says strip the tabs off the beginning of the line. So you can indent it and make the whole thing look pretty. Sorry? If anything goes, was at the end of the line or in the middle of the line, would it still stop there? No. Um, Anything goes has to be the first thing on the line. If you've got the dash there, it can be the first thing after a tab. But it's got to be the first thing on the line that's going to be read. OK, so this is how it works. From string, standard becomes everything from here to the next occurrence of that string. 
You can add a dash to ignore tabs at the start of the line. It is definitely tabs, not tabs and spaces. If you quote any part of that string, whether by um, single quotes or by back backslash, then nothing will be expanded inside that here document. Otherwise, you can put the names of variables with a dollar in front. You can put back ticks or whatever to expand stuff inside the, um, inside the here document. So you can do customized input fairly easily by interpolating bits of, uh, um, bits of variables that you've got in your current shell. So here's an example pipeline. I'm not suggesting you do this. But what we're going to do here is we're going to um, concatenate everything that's in the documentation that's text or HTML, translate capital letters to lowercase letters, complement the set and convert anything that isn't a lowercase letter into a new line, and then sort it. So then we've got a word list. right? That word list we might use later. Maybe you should do it. No, we won't do it, because I, I designed this for a system which is not a general Unix system, so you probably haven't got any text files and so forth in your thing. C control flow. We've already talked about exit status. Um, we've got four or five different ways of doing looping or conditional stuff. Um, bash also adds select, but it's uh, not in the project standard, unfortunately. Cont I've already told you all that. So here's an example, another example, using if. Again, we're going to get for zoom in temp words, throwing away the output, and if it's there, we'll echo zoom, and if it's not there, we'll echo slow. Easy? Right. Four iterates over its arguments. We've already seen this iterating over the arguments in, to, the, to the whole shell script. But this one here echoes this one. We've already, we've already seen that, so I won't spend too much time on it. So, let's try and put it together with an isUp script. What we want to be able to do here is find out whether some remote server is responding to SSH requests. The isUp script is in the Shelltude examples directory, so you can have a look at it, and have a look at it as we go through, because there's some slight differences between the one there and the one I'm going to show you, because there wasn't room on the slides. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start a shell function. New concept. If you've got some token, followed by parentheses in your shell script that says this is a function. We're going to store this away and invoke it later on. And you can invoke it just like you can invoke any other command. The body of the function is, set, is limited by braces. There. And we're going to put a whole heap of things together that we've, we've seen so far. First, we're going to SSH to $1. And the command that's given to SSH is sleep for one second. And we're going to put that in the background and capture the asynchronous the, 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 the post's ID of SSH. So what that should do, is, if, 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 if all your commands are OK, you'll say SSH, um, some server, sleep, that, sleep one, it'll go there, sleep for one second, then come back and return an exit zero. That's what you expect to happen. Because things can time out, and because it can take a long time to do resol resolving and root discovery and all the things you've got to do to do SSH, we're also going to have a process that's running at the same time that's going to kill it if it takes more than 15 seconds. So we'll sleep 15, and after that, we'll run kill-9 of $pid, which is that thing. And we'll throw away any um, uh, any errors. That's right. Because the process may already have gone away. The one that you've got there has got a couple more lines, and it also kills this process if this one succeeds. And that's why there's an and-and there. So if the sleep exits non-zero, we don't bother doing the, ki the, the kill. It's not really necessary, but still. So there's the is-up part, but how do you call it? Well, we're going to go for x, which is going iterating through all of the arguments. So you can say um, is-up, host1, host2, host3, host4, and goes through there. And then again, in a subshell, we'll call is-up x, and if it is, we'll just echo it, echo it and we'll echo it onto dollar Onto, very, onto file descriptor 3. We want to do this because we want to preserve file descriptor 2 for SSH to ask for your password. Hmm? So I close at the bottom of the beginning, yes. It's really, really clever. Um, what we do here is we redirect standard input and output 
from DevTTY, which is your current controlling terminal. And that's the only place you want to be able to get passwords from anyway. You don't want to have it come from some random file or something. You want to make sure that there's a real person there. And we save the process ID of the um, subshell here in a variable there. What this is going to do is it's going to concatenate the current asynchronous command on the end of the previous ones. You do that because the shell's got this wait construct, and you say just if you just say wait, it'll wait for all asynchronous commands to complete, but you don't get any exit statuses. And what we want to be able to do is exit with the status that says whether all the things were up or not. So after that, after we've done all that, we just spawned all those SSH commands. We'll say for PID in PIDs, wait for the PID. And if wait returns non-zero, we'll set ret equals one, and we'll finally exit with ret. I don't know whether you've got any servers you can try that on. I find it quite useful when I'm managing a cluster to find out which things in the cluster is, mis is, is down. We've seen shell arguments a little bit. Um, there's two forms. Uh, in general, you never want to use the dollar star. You always want to use dollar app because dollar app preserves white space, dollar star doesn't. The first nine are always available as dollar one through dollar nine. On some shells, you can go to dollar ten and following, but it's not portable. Watch the quoting. Shift throws arguments away. So if you type shift, it'll rename, it'll throw away dollar one and rename dollar two as dollar one, dollar two as dollar, sorry, dollar three as dollar two, all the way up to the previous inaccessible dollar ten becomes dollar nine. Which means that we could have written that original one, the original um, uh, E command, like this. While test dollar one, test with, with no dash x's or anything, just sees whether the, the string is given is zero length or not. Echo if it's there and then shift. So that's exactly the same as the 4x do echo dollar x. Unless you pass it, and then, no, that should work too. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, it does. Okay, here are some don't do's. I keep seeing in people who write shell scripts things like cat file through pipeline. There's no need for that. Because if pipeline's reading from standard input, you can just read about standard input. You don't need to start yet another process. You only do this kind of thing if there's more than one file there and you want to put all of them through the pipeline. If there's just one, there's no need. The other thing is that shell itself is not that fast. So try to minimize external operations. If you can refactor your program as a filtering program, so that you basically have things that pass through a filter and everything just gets executed once, it'll go a lot faster than anything else. In fact, that first, that first shell script we did, the um, bang one, if you cared about its performance, you could improve it significantly. Instead of doing, at the moment we've got while test dollar x greater than zero, do blah 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 blah, x equals x per dollar x plus one or minus one. Done. Remember that's how we had it before? That is executing, every time you go through the loop, it's executing that command and that command. We don't need to do either of those if we pre-compute how many we're going to be doing. So why not just instead do 4x in 9876543321. Then it's done all in the shell, and we haven't executed another two processes for every single one. So do think about whether you're using while or whether you're using for and how many things you're, you're executing. This is not quite so important on your desktops and laptops, but it becomes quite important when you're running on under, underpowered embedded systems, which is what I tend to do a lot. So the final one was I haven't introduced read, and that's for a good reason. If you're using while, pipe through read, you're probably doing it wrong. And we'll show you some examples of that in a little while. Yeah, and I've already said rework filtering prob problems is filtering problems. I'll give you some examples. 
here's one to find the number of shell scripts on the system. It's actually surprising how many of the, 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 the programs that you use every day are actually shell scripts internally. So what we're doing here is another thing for your another two programs for your toolbox. Find st takes some directory names and it starts there and walks the file system, applying a test to everything on that file system. So in this case, we're looking for ordinary files, type F, with at least one executable bit set. That's what the plus 0111 does. Who's beeping? Then we're going to take all those things and print them with a null termination between each one. We're going to do that in case there's new lines or anything else in the file names. Then we're going to pipe that through Xargs. Xargs reads things from its standard input and converts them into arguments. In this case, the arguments are going to be the names of the files. So effectively what this is going to do is if find prints out some number of things, <coughs> it'll convert them into arguments to file. What I suggest you do is type that bit first, leave out the dash print zero because it, it'll be totally unintelligible to you, and just see what, what comes out. So do that. There'll be lots and lots of executable files and the names of them printed out. What? There'll be oodles of them. Kill it with Control-C after you've seen enough. Just kill it after a few. <laughs> yeah. Next, try it with just xarg zero file dash n and leave out the last bit with the grep, and you'll see what the output of that bit is. What file does is it tries to work out what kind of thing a file is by looking inside it. So it'll look at its magic number. It'll look at uh, what character sets it's using. It'll look at all sorts of stuff to try and work out what sort of thing it is. In this case, it's going to look for the hash, hash bang, hash bin, hash sure. And the phrase text executable will appear in anything that's a script. It might be a shells, born shells text executable, or a bash text executable, or a Perl text executable. I said shell, but I really meant scripts. And finally, WC is word count. If you just give it if you just use it straight off, it'll um, count the thing, number of things in its standard input and give you the number of characters, the number of words, and the number of lines. With dash L, it just prints out the number of lines. So it's essentially what we're doing here is finding out how many times this grep succeeds and counting them. How about if you use uh, exec inside find instead of? That's evil. <laughs> What this does, right, is if you use exec, then every single time it finds a file, it'll, exec, it'll fork and exec another process. All right. This way, we only do it when we run out of buffer space for the size of the argument list. And on Linux, that's a really big number. So we end up executing file once. Okay? Xargs is a really useful tool. Yeah, I know. It's GNU trying to change things. So when are you supposed to use uh, exec in time? Never. <laughs> There's just occasionally we'll get out of a hole, but generally be aware it's there and be aware you shouldn't be using it. Okay, here's another one. This, this one I'm not expecting you to understand totally. Um, the puppy Linux distribution, one of the things it has in the make puppy script is a thingy for, for working out whether there's any shared libraries missing. Um, as it comes from the, the maintainer, it takes about four hours to run that, that uh, find shared libraries. This takes two minutes because it's reworked the problem as a pipeline instead of do, having a whole heap of nested while loops that were iterating over things. Um, again, we're trying to find executable files and find out what sort they are. Find the ones that are ELF executable, and this magic said thing, I'm not expecting you to understand it totally, will end up, even though you haven't seen it there, printing out just the name. Then we'll chroot into it and run LDD, which tells you what all the shared libraries that thing uses are. And then we'll pipe it through ORC, look for not found, and print out the name of the file. 
So that tells you which ones are missing. Anyway. One last thing, cleaning up your droppings. Sometimes you can't get away just with shell variables and you need to create a temporary file somewhere. You need to be able to clean that up afterwards, otherwise after someone's run your script 10 times there'll be 10 temporary files hanging around somewhere. And that's ugly. Trap is your friend. This one. What trap does is it says when this event happens, do that. This event can either be zero, which means this shell script's about to exit, or it can be the name of a signal. So you can say when signal hup arrives, do something. When signal nine arrives, you can't do anything anyway because you're dead. But the most useful one is zero. Um, so when this script's about to exit, do that. And then if you use a template file function, you can keep track of which temp files you've produced, and then remove them all in one look go. It's not going to work in a subshell because the value of temp files is not going to be visible in a subshell. Which is why I've set through here to $t, which this thing leaves as droppings. Okay? And that's only going to work if temp files, file names don't contain special characters. Okay? So, option arguments. This is the, about the last slide of teaching before we start getting into the major exercise. I'm sure you're all glad to hear that. Because <laughs> I think we're, well, I don't know what the time is. Okay. So, getOpts is a shell built in that acts very, very similarly to the getOpts inside your C program, except it doesn't do long arguments. I think GNU may have extended it to do long arguments, but hey, it's not portable. It takes two, getOps takes two arguments itself. The first one is a string that describes what options you're expecting. And the second one is the name of a variable. And what it does is it iterates for you, when it's in a while loop like this, iterates for you over all the arguments to the shell, that's all the things in $at, <coughs> and searches one at a time for things that match that string. And while it finds them, it'll keep on going. It then, if it sets C to one of these, that the option it is. So if you say um, shell fred dash n three, then in that case optarg will be set to three, and C will be set to n. I'm not expecting you to understand this totally until we start using the thing, but yeah. And if you get some other kind of um, argument that it doesn't recognise, it'll put a question mark into C. Question mark will be matched by a star, so you call usage, which is a shell variable somewhere which exits eventually. When it finishes, it sets the <coughs> number of the next argument to be processed into a variable called optint. So you shift it, and from there on after, you know that all your arguments are non-option arguments, and you can play with them. We'll be using that. Okay. First complete example. Please look in the example sheltered examples for, for a thing called finger with a capital F. No, I haven't got it there. I shall go to this one so we can go through it. 